This is the Northwood Report on ESPNWestPalm.com, taking you through everything that is Seahawks sports. Now, here's Jeremy Marks Peltz. And welcome to another exciting edition of the Northwood Report here on ESPNWestPalm.com. Jeremy Marks Peltz is joined by the Northwood Jack of All Trades, uh, handles sports information for every single sport at Northwood University, uh, and uh, has... Uh, he knows more about Northwood sports than anybody else. It is Chris Kendrick uh, joining us here. As, uh, we've got a lot to do. Men's basketball is in season. Women's soccer is about to start. The NAIA National Championships. Women's basketball in season as well. Got some golf news, plenty of stuff. But, uh, Chris, how are you doing today? Good, Jeremy. No, great uh, to be back for another Northwood Report. And let's start things off by saying congratulations on your wedding as well. I know it was a big weekend for you last uh, weekend. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, hopefully everything started off uh, well in your married life now. Uh, everything is good. You know, you have a honeymoon. So uh, I was going to say, if things are problematic on the honeymoon stage, then it's probably not a, uh, a good harbinger of things to come. But yeah. Uh, it uh, the the week was great and uh, appreciate you got hear your play by play uh, vocals uh, last Saturday against Madonna so uh, so I I am back refreshed and uh, in full spirits. Well, we're glad to have you back at the booth and uh, hope you're back and ready to enjoy some Northwood basketball. Uh, absolutely. Now we're gonna get into Northwood basketball here in a second. Uh, I gotta mention I know this is the Northwood podcast though, but you are a New England Patriot. <laughs> Of course. It has been what everybody has talked about. I don't know how much you've enjoyed talking about it the last 48 hours. Uh, your thoughts on the non-call that everybody has been discussing with Rob Gronkowski in the end zone. Um, I'm. Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, honestly, when you watch it in live action, it was one of those plays where Gronkowski's going towards his normal post pattern, and it seems like Brady just underthrew the ball. But, you know, you take the second look, you see Keekley's grabbing on Gronkowski, really not allowing him to get to the ball. So I can see where it easily, maybe not a pass interference, but at least a defensive holding call should have been played or should have been thrown on that play. And the ref needed to probably stick with his guns on that one. Yeah, I think you're being nice. I think it was a horrendous. It was a Yeah, it was awful. I mean, call. I, was, I, I would have liked to see more right effort now. from Gronko to maybe bulldoze Keekley there and get to that ball. But, you know, just one of those things. And honestly, for the Patriots, it shouldn't come down to a last-second drive. You know, Brady's been great in the past with that kind of stuff. But honestly, there's other plays in that game that they should have made to not have it come down to last-second drive. See, my whole thing is I, I just propose in the NFL that you get rid of the whole uncatchable thing. Because, like, yeah, I understand that there's going to be penalties on balls that are clearly uncatchable. But what we think is uncatchable and what is actually uncatchable are two different things when you consider how – freakish some yeah, of these exactly. athletes are especially it's, a guy like Gronkowski he's, exactly. a, he's the freak of all freaks you know him and Jimmy Graham are those guys that you throw the ball anywhere within maybe a seven foot window near them they're going to come down with the ball so you know I agree in that point that maybe you need to adjust that no the uncatchable ball uh, rule in the NFL yeah totally well I just want to give you an opportunity to get that off your chest right, well, still go Patriots I mean we're still top of the AFC so yeah uh, I think you'll, you'll beat the Broncos and uh, the that's Dolphins. another tough one man just coming in having a play Peyton now after that it's I actually think it's a good spot for the Patriots to win I mean it's, he has tr- difficulty coming into New England I'm hoping that it snows I mean I'm sorry to all my family up in Boston but <laughs> if it snows on sun- on Sunday night that'd be the best cause yeah just just not uh you know damaging anybody yeah, bring Ty Law back too please uh, I don't think you're gonna have much law uh, much, <laughs> much luck with that yeah. but uh all right men's basketball uh they are two and one this season they were number five in the uh, NAIA division two poll Coming into the season, of course, every single year, men's basketball is right up there amongst the NAIA's best and the Sun Conference's best. So uh, our opening broadcast and the opening game, Rolly Massimino Court Dedication Day, uh, was a couple Thursdays ago uh, when they had a big 90-67 to victory over Clearwater Christian. And, uh, you know, it's a 23-point victory, but in talking to Rolly Massimino and also to Jake Lockhart after the game, uh, they were pretty displeased with the performance, and so uh, you've been around them. I haven't these last couple of games. Uh, a nail-biting victory over number 17, Madonna, uh, also part of the Dick Versace tip-off classic. And then last Saturday, a rare loss uh, in the Palm Beach Atlantic series. I believe it's the first time they've, they've lost to Palm Beach Atlantic in five years. So I can't imagine that uh, a 2-1 and one start, while it sounds good, uh, being over 500, I can't imagine that's exactly what Roley Massimino and the coaching staff 
uh, envisioned for this team. Yeah, it's uh, clearly the start that no one was really expecting here, especially, like you said, coming off that loss to PBA. We haven't lost them in five years. Of course, they're an NCAA D2 program, so they're able to get a lot more talent there. But as far as you know, the level of talent is still close uh, between us and PBA, so it's always been good matches. They've been hesitant to play us in the past, and they just got Coach Balza there, and he brought in a lot of talent, was willing to play us, and they were able to outplay us on that day. And it's funny that you mentioned that stuff about Clearwater because the next day when Madonna played Clearwater, they hung 20-0 and 0 on Clearwater. So I can see where Coach Massimino and Jake were expecting a better outcome against a team like Clearwater. They're someone who you should, you know, beat by, you know, 30, 40 points. Madonna hung 106 on them. So, I mean, that's probably where they were a little dismayed. And now coming off this loss to PBA, it's, it's going to be a tough road for the Seahawks here. Well, now here's the good news, though, is, you know, this team had 10 10- new players coming in so there's obviously going to be an adjustment period and and i would expect i don't don't know what the the final record's going to be or the final ranking or even what the expectation should be uh but i would think this team is going to be a lot better uh basically every time they step onto the court but especially a lot better as we get towards the home stretch uh than they are right now so i would think if there's a time to to have a loss that uh you know you certainly don't want to have it might be uh, early on in the year against the Palm Beach Atlantic. Yeah, you definitely want to have, you know, get these bumps in the road out of the way early in the season. Honestly, I thought if any game they're going to drop early, it was going to be that one in Madonna. They're a nationally ranked team. They have experience in the tournament, and they bring back, you know, a core of solid veteran players. Seahawks were able to escape that one and then kind of just ran into a buzzsaw in PBA. But hopefully they can look to rebound. They're going to play Trinity on Friday before they go into a big matchup against Embry Riddle to kick off the Sun Conference yeah, it's season. Five and zero Embry Riddle. Yeah, five and zero in uh, Indiana Wesleyan and Cardinal Stritch, the two and one teams respectively in the nation already lost. So when this wow. game rolls around, you you could see Embry Riddle as the top team in the nation. Wow, and that'd be a great spoiling uh, position there for Northwood. Jeremy Marks, Peltz, Chris Kendrick, Northwood podcast here on ESPNWestPalm.com. One of the newcomers is Chris Solomon. Uh, and he has put up monster numbers thus far, averaging better than 20 points per game. Uh, and it seemed like Chris Solomon was the guy, you know, from even watching him those first couple of practices, just has more natural scoring ability than anybody else on the team. Yeah, he's he's got quite a touch from the outside. Uh, Chris is a terrific shooter. He's averaging 21 points a game for the Seahawks. He's leading our team in scoring right now. And um, you saw him late in that PBA game try to be the one who took the game over, put the team on his back, and try to get those buckets. But... Things, unfortunately, just didn't go the way for the Seahawks. But you can see him trying to assume that leadership role in the team, which is good for, like you mentioned, this young team with a lot of new faces. Need someone to kind of set up and uh, assert themselves as a leader. So you've got Chris Solomon there, and you said asserting himself as a leader, which which I would think is even more of a bonus. Um, who who else, though? Who's that number two guy? Is there a number two guy in this team? Uh, well, we've mentioned him already in I think he's been a surprise of the Seahawks. He came on late last year, and that's Jake Lockhart. Uh, he played big in a loss last year for Northwood. Had uh, his career-high 16 rebounds against Weber uh, last season. And then against PBA in the losing effort, he posted his first career double-double. Had 18 points, 15 rebounds. A lot of that on the offensive glass. Created those second-chance opportunities for Northwood that helped to rally them back late in the uh, second half. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to go the way Northwood went. But to see the strides Jake has taken from last year to this year is great and I look to see him be really one of those players who could be a real asset to Northwood, uh, not on, only in terms of his leadership and his experience with the team, but also now his talents on the floor. Yeah, wonderful to see. Just a wonderful person, a senior from Antigua. Uh, and he has, as you said, embraced that leadership role. Uh, it's something that he's looked forward to. Um, but averaging now 11.7 points, 11.7 rebounds, those numbers may be a little inflated by that game against Palm Beach Atlantic. Uh, it would be awesome. I, I don't think there's anybody uh, that you can root for uh, more so than a guy like Jake Lockhart. Yeah, he's, he's a, a real terrific person. kid. He's a great student, but also a great student athlete. He's uh, won a DAC Stats uh, NAI Scholar Athlete last year, which I believe you have to have at least a 3.7 GPA. So, you know, Jake is very, very versatile to the Seahawks, both on and off the court, and that's where they need to, you know, utilize him this season. And speaking of wonderful moments, I know it's a couple weeks past, but uh, we haven't had a chance in the podcast to talk about the Roley Massimino court dedication. We did so uh, throughout the weekend uh, at Northwood. But uh, what was that like for you, uh, being you know part of this university for a while, unfolding and seeing uh, someone that is just a true legend, you know, a college basketball Hall of Famer, uh, get an honor that even he had said he, he didn't think he would get. He was humbled by it. 
it's I mean it's really a privilege for me uh, just to be in a program like Northwood, but to get all these uh, experiences being with a co- guy like Coach Massimino, where you're traveling to Kentucky and Michigan State, and now you're doing court dedications and you know, just being around that kind of atmosphere at a level that Northwood is at is just, you know, very rare. So being able to be a part of that is great. And just being able to meet all the people that Coach knows and just shake hands and hear stories, it's it's very, uh, very you know, just a privilege for me. Well, good stuff there. Uh, so men's basketball again. Next up, Trinity at home on Friday. We'll have that broadcast for you, 8 o'clock ESPN West Palm. Dot com and then the big Embry Middle uh, Embry Riddle matchup uh, a couple of weeks from now. Yeah, hopefully that Trinity game can be kind of the game where the Seahawks can really right the ship there, especially heading into that big time that battle against a rival and probably the top team in the nation, Embry yeah, Riddle. Absolutely, and you can't uh, look ahead, Trinity, uh, with number one on the horizon as well. Jeremy Marks, Peltz, Chris Kendrick. When we come back, plenty more to talk about, including women's soccer, maybe uh, getting an NAIA crown. You're going to want to stay tuned for that. It's the Northwood Report here on ESPNWestPalm.com. Right, welcome back to the Northwood Report. Jeremy Marks Peltz, rejoined by Chris Kendrick, the guy who knows everything about Northwood Seahawks athletics. Uh, we were talking about men's basketball. Uh, they are 2-1. and one. They take on Trinity on Friday and then a huge matchup against Embry-Riddle in a couple weeks, December 5th. Embry-Riddle very likely could be the number one team in the NAIA Division II poll uh, when they come to West Palm Beach. Uh, women's soccer, they are number two in the NAIA uh, poll, and they have the national championships uh, going on. First, explain this format here, Chris, how the uh, national championships work and the race to uh, to get yourself a title in soccer. Sure. Uh, it's it's different uh, than some some tournaments, you know, we're more familiar with uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament, things of that nature. Uh, with the women's soccer tournament, they pick 32 teams. Um, the conference tournament winners automatically get bids. There's regular season uh, winners that automatically get bids, as well as a handful of at-larges. And the way the opening round works is that the top seed hosts. So that's why you find the Seahawks hosting uh, Bellevue this Saturday at 2 p.m. at Arrigo Vasilio Field in the opening round of the NAIA Women's Soccer National Tournament. So after that point, well, after the opening round where the host team hosts, everybody then takes a trip to Orange Beach, uh, Alabama, and that's where the national tournament is hosted. And the rest of the remaining rounds of play are all played at that complex. So, you know, the number two ranking, uh, you know, certainly really, really high. So how would you forecast for this soccer team if they were to potentially win a national championship, they would need to do what? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of things. I mean, this women's soccer team is very high powered. Um, They're they finished their season with a 14 one and one record. Uh, They beat Embry Riddle for the second time this season in the North versus South game to win that regular season crown. Uh, they've been unbeaten for four straight seasons in conference play. So a lot of experience on this Lady Seahawks team, and I think that's going to be their key moving forward, just having all these girls have been uh, four-year players and just you know intertwined with each other on and off the fields for so long that they're all pretty much just a sisterly bond. And I know that we've done a few local broadcasts here, and they've kind of hit on the diversity of the team and how a lot of them are international students, and they sort of have to create their own family here in West Palm being so far away from home. So a lot of that family aspect, the experience, and just the whole togetherness of this team is really going to be vital for them in this tournament. Yeah, and, and I mean, how much does that translate on onto the field when you have, you know, girls that come from all different parts of the world? And, and like you said, they are, they're almost forced to, not that they wouldn't want to, I'm sure they do, but that, that they're, they're forced to bond together and, and develop that chemistry off the field, it sounds like, before they do it on the field. Um, yeah, that chemistry, I think the the key is that on the field, these girls are just so familiar with each other that they kind of, they're instinctually know where everybody's going to go. Like when Maria gets the ball in the backfield, she knows to look up the wing to see Louise Bolt sprinting up that sideline, getting towards that goal. These girls are just so familiar with each other. They know each other's tendencies and they thrive on that. Just, you know, the fluidity of the team on the field is just impressive to watch. Just that familiarity with each other and just the ball movement and, their ability just to be such a juggernaut offensively is just something to watch. So Saturday, Northwood hosting Bellevue uh, to start off the NAIA Women's Soccer National Championship. And again, if they win that, they will uh, get a chance to uh, go to Orange Beach, Alabama 
for the 30th annual NAIA National Championship December 2nd through the 7th. See, Embry-Riddle is uh, also right in the mix. It almost feels like destined that it'll be another Northwood-Embry-Riddle matchup uh, somewhere deep in the tournament. Uh, It could be. I mean, with the way things are working out, the Sun Conference uh, is one of only a few conferences. I believe I didn't get the actual number yet, but they have three teams in this tournament field. When you look at Bellevue, who won the Midland Athletic or Midland Collegiate Athletic Conference, they're the only team from that conference in the field. So you can see just the depth of what the Lady Seahawks have gone through this year, facing teams like Embry Riddle twice, having to play St. Thomas, who are both tournament teams, top 10 teams in the nation. So hopefully that just experience this season can uh, give the Lady Seahawks just some momentum in the tournament. And if they happen to run across an Embry Riddle along the way, it'll just you know be a little icing on the cake if they can uh, take it home. And one other thing uh, I want to get in is is talking about the experience of watching a, a home match like coming up on Saturday. Uh, I got a chance to see the end of that Embry Riddle match. It was actually in the middle of basketball practice, so it was pretty cool. Roly Massimino and the coaching staff uh, let the players uh, out, uh, and they went across the street to watch it. Like it's it's just such a cool atmosphere because it feels like it's right in the middle of everything. Yeah, the position on uh, campus where the soccer field is is nice. You see a lot of traffic going by. It's very close to the athletic center where. Basketball players can just leave practice and come on over to the soccer field if the coach wants them to. So just having it kind of in that focal point of campus just has a lot of activity to the field. And, you know, we hope it keeps up this Saturday with a big-time matchup at 2 o'clock against Bellevue. Yeah, 2 p.m. afternoon matchup, you know, middle of your day. is not going to take up everything. So, uh, you know, come out and, and support a local team like the Northwood women's soccer team. All right, a couple more things before we sign off here on the Northwood Report. Women's basketball in season as well, and Charnell Brown has gotten off to a huge start. First Sun Conference Women's Basketball Player of the Week award uh, for Brown, playing under Courtney McDaniel. Yeah, women's basketball, uh, so far 1-3 and three on the year, but uh, they had a tough road trip against um, NAI D2 schools up in Georgia, North Georgia, Georgia Southwestern. So those are just kind of games where you can get your team a lot of experience going against uh, some upper-level talent in the field. Again, with women's basketball, it's going to come down to how Lady Seahawks perform in conference. Um, They were picked, I believe, fourth overall in the conference. And uh, I think Coach McDaniel and the Lady Seahawks are going to surprise some people. And one of the focal points of the offense this year will be Sharnell Brown. And like you mentioned, she won her uh, Sun Conference Player of the Week this week. She's third in the conference in points with 18.6 a game. She's ninth in rebounding with 6.8 rebounds a game. So, you know, she's going to be a focal point of the offense, but also look to Aaron Riley. She's been a four-year starter for the Seahawks, one of the all-time greats in the program. Uh, So look for her to step up as well and kind of form a nice uh, duo down low. Uh, And then finally, I know golf is a couple of months away from uh, hitting the schedule, but uh, there's some news uh, on the links for the uh, Northwood Seahawks. Yep, uh, the NAIA preseason polls came out last week, and the Seahawks made an appearance in both the men's and women's poll. Our men's golf team checked in at 14th in the NAI men's golf preseason poll, and the women's team checked in at 7th in their poll. So that's good going into the season. I know uh, SCAD up uh, in Georgia, their ladies' team was number one overall. So, again, you can just see how that talent in the Sun Conference, you know, playing against these type of squads really can benefit a lot of our teams heading into national play. Good stuff, Chris. Uh, we will do it again in the Northwood Report soon, ESPNWestPalm.com. And, of course, uh, Got the next basketball broadcast Friday night uh, on ESPNWestPalm.com, 8 o'clock, Northwood against Trinity. Yep, uh, let's just run through the plug list real quick. So let's remind everyone, women's soccer, number two in the nation, playing Bellevue in the NAIA Women's Soccer uh, National Tournament opening round. That's going to be at Northwood on Arrigo Vasilio Field, Saturday at 2 p.m. We want everyone to come out. It's also a whiteout game, so our Seahawks fans, we want to encourage them to wear white. And we'll also have T-shirts available uh, to commemorate the event with um, you can get those T-shirts if you make a $10 donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So the Seahawks are going to partner with Make-A-Wish on this big day. We also want to remind everyone that men's basketball is going against Trinity on Friday at 8 p.m., again, before that big-time matchup against Embry-Riddle December 5th. So everyone mark your calendars. It's going to be a big-time NAI matchup December 5th at Northwood at 7 p.m. Uh, women's basketball returns home against Montreat Friday, November 29th at 4 Then I just want to remind everyone that they can stay up to date with their Northwood Seahawks athletics at seahawks.gonorthwood.com. On Facebook at facebook.com slash NUSeahawks. On twitter.com, twitter.com slash NUSeahawks. You can follow myself on Twitter at ckendrick86. We've also been putting the podcast up on YouTube now. So if you want to go back and... Back in snazzy graphics. Yeah, too. just a little Photoshop work from the old Swiss Army knife, Chris Kendrick. So uh, you can Did you go just back. Go third person there. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, nice. So you can <laughs> you can just check out uh, all the uh, archive podcasts on our YouTube page at Northwood Seahawks. 
Well, good stuff. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk to you uh, coming up uh, pretty soon here, Swiss Army Knife. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm hoping to take a nice trip to Alabama here, beginning of December for women's soccer. I think big things here, and uh, they're looking good. I'm, I'm excited about women's soccer. And, of course, big-time men's basketball game, December 5th against Embry-Riddle. Absolutely. You've been listening to the Northwood Report here on ESPNWestPalm.com.